All right, that's all yours. Okay, I'll start. Uh, I'll share my screen. I have some some slides put together. So I think. Um, let's see. Uh, where did it go? I have to, hold on. Let me close one thing. Um, so welcome to the reproducibility in HPC panel at the Open Source Symposium at UCSC. Um, so we. We were tasked with the reproducible builds um, title, I guess, when we when we originally put this together. But we expanded it a little bit to cover reproducibility in HPC. And I think, I, you know, from past instances of this symposium and also other uh, happenings in the community, like so, uh, you know, uh, Carlos has done a lot of work in reproducibility along with Eva Jimenez at uh, UCSC, and many many conferences um, have been adding reproducibility tracks to. Um, sort of combat this reproducibility crisis across the scientific research world. Um, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that research in CS and in other fields um, can't be readily reproduced. Um, and so, you know, people have started including artifacts um, with their, their paper submissions. Um, and that's even caught on in HPC. So I, I think, uh, Carlos, if you recall um, what percent of uh, SC papers last year um, actually got the badges um, just off the top of your head? I mean, I think it was a fairly good percentage, like 60 or higher. Yes, um, yes, definitely and so, more than half. Yeah, it was actually quite a high number. Yeah, so it's definitely catching on. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's interesting because um, in HPC, um, there were a lot of people who said that uh, reproducibility was, you know, a, a unique problem for HPC because um, we're fundamentally operating on, um, you know, unique resources. Like you build this supercomputer. And it, it is to some extent unique because it's it's among the biggest in the world. Not many people have those resources. So how do you reproduce something um, on um, a machine that you don't have access to? Uh, moreover, there have been lots of uh, discussions in HPC about you know how how valid are performance results and how reproducible are they really? Like you're you're not going to get the exact same performance results if you run them multiple times, um, and they can depend on CPU, GPU, system software, and so on. So how do you really extract the um, the fundamental lesson uh, from a paper uh, that's about performance, and and so the argument that's been made is, you know, that a lot of performance papers are are not useful for that long after they come out because the the machines just aren't, you know, the, they're not the top machines anymore. The performance lessons change over time. The types of hardware that are that are popular at any given time change, um, and and so you know maybe we're looking at the problem wrong. Maybe what we're not looking for is not um, exact reproducibility. Um, or, or maybe we need to enable it better. I'm not sure. Um, and so the question for this panel is, are, are we looking at the problem in the wrong way? Um, and do we really care about reproducing a particular build um, or a particular experiment or really the conclusion um, from the paper? Is the conclusion valid? And is that really the lesson that we take away from things? Um, I guess I can say from you know experience from some of the SC reproducibility reviews um, that I've seen, that um, the, the reproducibility reviewers do seem to be reviewing for whether the conclusions are, are reproducible from um, what you give them, not whether the results are exactly um, what they saw in the paper. Um, so we've got four panelists here um, to talk about these different things. Um, we've got Fareed Zakaria, who is a student um, at UCSC and um, also works at Google. He's gonna talk about reproducibility in Nix, a project that he works on and one of the original package managers that really cared about reproducibility. Um, We've got Harshitha Minan from Livermore, um, and she's going to talk about numerical reproducibility in scientific codes. So yet another thing that can interfere with your ability to reproduce um, a, a scientific result. Uh, Tom is going to talk about some work that we've actually done um, with Fareed um, on shrink wrap, uh, which is a way to make the builds of programs a little more uh, reproducible and a little more likely to run um, the way that you expect them to. And then I'm going to talk about um, you know, whether you can, you, Nix is unique in that it doesn't really have a solver um, in the in the package manager. Um, I'm going to talk about how you might blend solvers with that approach and do something like approximate reproducibility for HPC. Um, so disclaimer, before we start the panel, this is a somewhat biased view on reproducibility because all four of us work together. <laughs> and, um, it, but I hope you enjoy the talks and um, I, I hope we get some other perspectives from the audience at the end when we do discussions. So I think with that, um, let's kick it off with Fareed. Yeah, cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I will let you share your screen. Hold on, let me oh, stop yeah, sharing. Uh, 
How do I stop? Am I still sharing? I think I am. Where is the stopping sharing button? There we go. Okay. You should be able to share now. Let's see if I can. Hello, can you guys still hear me? Yep, we can see your screen too. Okay, it's not showing my screen. Okay, well, I'll trust it. So no, we, we, we can see your screen. We see lib Etsy bin. Okay, great. It doesn't show me that. Well, that's fine. Oh, okay. yeah. um, I just thought I'd do one or two slides on what Nix is for those aren't you know, familiar. So, you know, reproducibility hasn't garnered so much attention in the past because there's been a big rise of convention. And that's taken us pretty far from, you know, the origins of Multics when shared objects were invented to today. And a, a lot of that is due in part to the file, file system hierarchy standard. So this is probably like, for many of you that work in Linux, probably the folders you've come to either love and or hate. So, I, you know, maybe the most prominent ones I put here are lib, etsy, and bin. These are how the majority of applications find their dependencies, find their files, and start up. And things are mostly portable because there's been like an unspoken handshake rule across different distributions that I'm going to put my file you know, here. You can expect to find it here under these well-known paths, and it's kind of been ratified, this file system hierarchy standard. So this handshake has gotten more, the conventions become more cemented. And there's been an immense burden by library authors to basically help make sure that ABI compatibility across versions remains pretty stable. So the challenge with the, this model is you have a pretty limited key space. When you're only relegated to putting your libraries in slash lib, the key space now is only one level deep. And if things expect to find library A, that file can only really exist as library A, you know, with the caveat is now there's some major versioning schemes. You'll see like lib a.1, lib a.2. But the point I'm making here is it's pretty coarse. So if you're an application author and you want to depend on library A, and maybe even at this like very coarse version two, the understanding that it's portable has worked out because the, the library author of library A has taken tremendous burden to make sure that across their versions that may be found on the disparate Linux distributions that it's largely going to work for your application. Let's say this, this has gotten us to the 80-20. 80% um, it's working, you know, and then you have the one out of 20 coworker, friend, colleague, someone helplessly screaming into the void in the internet, but it doesn't work on my machine. Like there's got to be a, a different way. So uh, briefly touch again, on just uh, these are the only real two slides I want to touch on. And it's just to give some precursor information for everyone else. So SPAC, Nix, Geeks, there's been this new wave of ushered package managers or way of really building software, uh, a deployment model that came out of Nix originally. And I, I'm calling it the store model. I think that's kind of the colloquial way to refer to it. So the, the major premise here is rather than storing all your libraries and binaries in these convention paths, opt, bin, everything's going to be rooted at a very specific uh, directory called the store. And the links between entries can only also coexist in the store, and they're very specific. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to what I mean by specific in that sense. So here, here's like a little, oh, here's a little diagram on the left of um, an example store. So you have the Hello app. You have subversion and open SSL and the links between the shared objects. So their dependencies can only exist within the store. What do I mean by specific? Well, there's this garbled text at the front. That's actually uh, a type of hash. And it's what one refers to as a pessimistic hash. So it's a hash of all the source needed to build that application or library at a very specific commit or point in time and a hash of not only its source, but all the source of its dependencies. So this is pessimistic, meaning if you change 
a single letter in a very deeply nested dependency, it's going to reverberate through this graph, changing the hashes along the way. What the store model solves is uh, twofold. One is expansive key space. This hash at the prefix of the directory lets you now install applications or libraries side by side. So I can have many versions of subversion. In fact, there's two different versions here. Even though there's also a version suffix, that doesn't matter. I, I can pick the same version, but maybe just two commits apart from each other. So maybe they haven't even bumped versioning, right? Those two commits are gonna differ in some source and that's gonna result in a different hash and they could reside side by side. The links are forced to only be within the store through a feature known as run path. And that's a way of instructing the linker to only look for my dependencies at these very specific directories. So that was kind of a very like two minute description of what could be a two hour topic. And this sets the stage now for the groundwork of these new tools like SPAC and Nix and Geeks of a, a very focused look on reproducibility. And I was talking to some people at the symposium earlier in person that my, my view of reproducibility is like an onion. And every time I feel like I'm at the innermost, I either hit a new problem area and find out there's many more layers to it, or someone else is already, you know, someone else in, introduces me to those many new layers. So this has gotten us considerably further, like deeper into that onion core of reproducibility. Um, and there's innovative work happening to kind of take it to the ultimate conclusion, which is bootstrapping, and maybe we'll talk about it on the, the panel, but uh, I'm very excited about what this new paradigm has let us do. I'll stop sharing. That's my intro. Okay, thanks. Um, let's go on to Harshitha. I hope you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, we can see your screen. So um, scientific knowledge is cumulative, right? So reproducing a result is a very common practice that most researchers use to confirm their um, findings or and avoid reinventing the wheel. So reproducibility is important not just because it ensures the results are correct, but also because it ensures transparency and gives us confidence in actually understanding what exactly was done. And so now there is a lot of discussion about that and it's widely agreed that reproducibility is very key to any scientific progress. But despite this widely accepted notion, uh, many fields are still experiencing a reproducibility crisis. We've seen these kind of headlines in uh, popular press where um, there is a lot of discussion about reproducibility crisis. There was in fact a um, uh, survey in Nature uh, where they surveyed about 1,500 researchers uh, who took a brief online um, questionnaire on reproducibility and they found something very interesting, which is that although 50% of the people agree that the, there is a crisis of reproducibility, only 30% thought that um, it was very important. So most would say they would still trust the publication, um, even though there is no reproducible uh, results, uh, as in like, it's not, a, uh, they are not able to reproduce it. And 70% of the researchers did try, but failed to reproduce somebody else's result. And more than half had failed to reproduce their own results. So to understand the concept of reproducibility, I think it's important to have a common framework and how we deal with this reproducibility. And Dr. Victoria Storen, who's done a lot of work in this area, had classified it basically into empirical reproducibility, computational, and statistical reproducibility. So as expected, empirical reproducibility, which is what typically appears in this press uh, releases, uh, involves physically reproducing the experiments on a wet lab sort of setting. Uh, and what kind of experiment design did they have? What kind of setup did they have? 
And usually there are a lot of assumptions and type of knowledge about how to conduct the experiment. So quantifying that and um, writing it down um, is the way to reproduce empirical reproducibility. Computational reproducibility, this is what I'll, my talk will be on. Computational science is where we use computers, right, for discovery purposes. Simulations have been used for various things like drug discovery, um, uh, weather prediction, and understanding our universe as such. So now, um, in today's time, the code is what contains the scientific record. So reproducibility here would generally mean that I would run the code with the same data and I should get the same results or at least the conclusion, same conclusions. Uh, statistical reproduce with this lot of issues around statistical inference, and that could lead to non-generalizable results. For example, running a lot of tests and cherry picking them using not the appropriate stats method, uh, not using random sampling, or you know um, the data handling is not done appropriately. So reproducibility here would mean handle giving a plan of how the data was handled, details about the test that was used and what exact parameters were used for the model and things like that. So high performance computing is central, is very critical to solving large problems in science and engineering, right? Many times the, the development of these codes take a long time, like spanning even decades and involves dozens of computer scientists, domain scientists and all. So here is an example that I want to show of a code that was developed at, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. This is a hydrodynamic simulation code called Lagos. And what they noticed was that when they used the IBM compiler XLC with a different optimization from moving from minus 02 to minus 03, it suddenly gave a 2.4x speed up. But in the very first iteration, it had a relative error of 11%. And it, in fact, the, the science didn't even make sense. There was a negative gas density and, uh, and energy was not conserved at all, even just after one iteration. So one has to be very careful about these things. We might just get carried away by speed up without checking into the accuracy of the results. Something similar was seen in porting a climate model code to a machine. Uh, this is a popular Earth system model, uh, CESM, that is used in many of the cutting edge HPC, HPC architectures. So when this climate model um, code, modeling code was ported to, uh, at that time, new platform Mira at um, Argonne National Lab, the output, uh, it was expected that it's not going to be bit identical, but what they found was that they got totally different scientific conclusions by just running it on a new machine. Uh, so what turned out in that particular case was there was some compiler optimization uh, that had resulted in uh, non-deterministic floating point computation. So this 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 uh, took a long time to find out what exactly was going on because that th this was totally unexpected. So there's now a lot of emphasis on reproducibility and this report that was put together in 2019 by the National Science and Technology Council to the president uh, on the National Strategy um, Initiative um, mentions that computational reproducibility is a requirement for science to progress and it deserves due attention. So what is reproducibility in our context? Um, there are so many different things that um, ways you can define it. One of the popular um, definition is this, obtaining a bitwise identical result from different runs of the same program on this exact same input irrespective of what resource was used. So what is the motivation for this kind of reproducibility, right? So one of the very first thing is, uh, if you don't have reproducibility, how am I supposed to debug the results? Um, uh, I, might, I would typically have to run it multiple times to identify the source of the problem. In large-scale simulations um, that are looking at 
rare events, and if the rare, rare event occurs, you definitely need to go back and reproduce it so that you can understand uh, why did it happen. And if we cannot reproduce it, it's hard to convince anybody. Um, and many times these rare events can lead to policy changes. Um, we need to be able to be sure about the results. When porting to a new simulation code to a new machine, uh, a simulation code to a new machine, if the results are not reproducible, you wouldn't really know whether the, the issue is with the machine, the architecture, or is it just the normal behavior of the code? And there are other reasons like the contractual reasons. Um, if a software says a building is going to fall based on a, solution, a simulation for liability purposes, lawyers want to ensure that the results don't change, just the next run. But we need to make sure that reproducibility shouldn't be equated to accuracy. A very accurate result, uh, for example, using a very high precision might not be reproducible. And a reproducible result might be much less accurate. So it's, it's very, um, natural to use very high precision, like double precision in scientific computing. It, it, it is true that using a high precision does make this non-reproducible events rare, um, but it does not guarantee any reproducibility because it will depend on the algorithm. Uh, if, if the inputs are ill-conditioned, um, that could definitely affect the uh, reproducibility of the output. So, so let's look at some uh, cases of non-reproducibility. Um, so in this particular case, I'm talking about floating point errors. So the reproducibility is not caused by round of errors, but by the non-determinism of the round of, accumulated round of error. So uh, as a result, right, uh, the floating point error output of a floating point error computation will depend on the order in which they were executed. So um, each, so therefore each run could give you a different result. Um, and therefore mathematical identities that we take for granted such as distributive associative do not apply here. And we cannot just interchange division with multiplication um, just because of this um, reason. Here's a little example um, showcasing this aspect. So this is a single precision summation of three values, x, y, and z. And we see that the same mathematical expression, a sum of three uh, variables, uh, can produce different output depending on the ordering in which they were uh, done. So what else could cause non-reproducibility in HPC applications? Um, running them on a new hardware, such as GPU. Most of the floating point standard has been implemented, but there are definitely some deviations that one need to be careful about. Perhaps the, this application was run on a different number of processes because things like global sum, um, that, that takes into account the order in which the operands appear are not reproducible when the number of processes change. Network topology might have changed. There is heterogeneity that can cause changes in the reduction tree. Um, and sometimes there is a drastic increase in the communication cost that changes the whole scheduling order, resulting in um, non-reproducible results. So there are some special uh, hardware units like the tensor cores that are fast, but then they produce results that are different from the standard. Then there's this case of FMA, fuse multiply add, um, adder. This feature is very important for our high performance computing codes to achieve um, good performance. It's basically combining two operations, add and multiply into one. This reduces the rounding error, but you know, using FMA ha has been shown to uh, result in a variability in the results. So some architectures may support it, some may not. Therefore, you might get different results. Uh, hardware support for multiple precision. That's another reason for variability. Uh, inconsistencies due to how they interact with each other, what kind of conversions are happening and things like that. 
there are many other reasons too, such as compiler optimizations. They do have the capability of changing the results. The main reason why that happens is that uh, they employ aggressive compiler optimizations, such as, such as fast math and GCC and Clang, which violate IEEE floating point semantics in exchange for faster code execution. So this is not necessarily a compiler bug, but it is due to the effects of, you know, how the associated property of the associated property is not maintained for the floating point round of errors. So what you end up doing is maybe achieving a wrong result faster. So these compiler optimizations um, have to be done very carefully because they they have some assumptions about the codes, such as you know. Um, there are no subnormals or there is no infinity in the code and things like that. While it might be applicable to some applications, uh, one has to be very careful while dealing with them. Then there are <clears throat> uh, uh, exception handling. In the traditional CPU programming uh, system, um, there are several methods to handle floating point exceptions like division by zero, overflows, and other things. But such, such um, things are not on uh, available on GPUs. For example, NVIDIA GPU has no real mechanism for detecting exceptions um, according to the CUDA programming guide. So if exceptions are not handled reproducibility across different architecture, it can affect the control flow and result in different results. Different results. So, there are other reasons like the database that is very well known and we have studied them quite a bit. It can result in deadlocks and particularly these compiler optimizations can make those things worse as well. So how do we enforce reproducibility? And re non-reproducibility I think is a very valuable indicator for the, uh, for the problems, problems in the code. So the results are dependent on the platform or the location of parentheses for a summation, they indicate that these are numerically unstable algorithms irrespective of anything else. So something to think about is to design numerically stable algorithm. And one way we can take a, understand a little more deeper into how stable they are is by using backward error analysis. Um, so this might help shed some light on whether the algorithms are stable at all. We need to have a uniform way of handling floating point exceptions across different architectures and understanding um, the extent to which they can change uh, from one system to another um, can, you know, can really help uh, support these reproducible experiments. So one way to do would be uh, to uh, use tools that help find the source of these floating point uh, irregularities. So there are several uh, tools listed in that uh, link there, um, some of which are developed by our colleagues here at the lab and some are um, from other universities as well. So we could employ these tools to understand where the, um, there is instability in the algorithm, or where these kind of uh, non-reproducible things happen and identify the root cause automatically. Another solution would be to use deterministic computation. So we, we but that's not really possible, making sure that the summation happens in the exact order on a large machine will just, you know, it's just a waste of resources and then causes unnecessary communication overhead. We can do it by eliminating the rounding error. Um, and there are several ways that has been discussed in literature, which is some of them include fixed point arithmetic, but that limits the range of the arguments, values, variables that it can take. Exact arithmetic, um, but that increases the memory usage and things like that. Now there are reproducible linear algebra libraries, uh, uh, RepoBlas and EXPLAS something that one can use if we are very um, stringent on the reproducibility aspects. So now looking into the future, the hardware heterogeneity and diversity is just going to make things harder and not just not easier. So focusing, uh, focusing reproducibility on critical modules might be one way, like 
we use in verification because it's so expensive we would be verifying critical modules and not every single module there are uh, methods to quantify the uncertainty in the results this is especially important in the deep learning era where we need to know how certain are we about the uh, results of the model there are several tools that are there to uh, support in these um, aspects and to identify the root cause of reproducibility. And there are a lot of um, workshops organized and activities that are happening in the community. And we need better community engagement and better information exchange between the GPU vendors and the users to really understand how it's been implemented and what could be the possible reproducibility problems. So, thank you. All right, thanks, Arjun. Uh, let's. Uh, it, uh, just to remind everybody, if you um, if you want to add questions, Carlos has put the link to the the Google Doc for questions over in the uh, the chat. So let's go to Tom um, to talk about Trinkrat. This All right, of, great. I hope. Yep, we can see your screen. Right. So Fareed motivated this relatively well for me earlier, talking about the difference between the FHS model and the store model. Um, when we talk about things in general distributions, we have a tendency to think of things that are all in the file system hierarchy standard, standard model. He talked about NICs, geeks, there are other systems that do this. But something that we don't think about a whole lot is that HPC systems also have a tendency to install a large number of packages multi-versioned in their own directories. And we have a tendency to follow this kind of store-like model, even if we're doing it manually. And the mix of doing it manually and doing it with all these interesting systems and compilers has a tendency to bring up interesting problems that come up as things like slightly slow performance on NICs, but in HPC systems show up as broken software. So we've been investigating ways to get some of the benefits of static linking semantics, things like being able to actually know that the application you load in an installed environment as a user is the one that was built. Um, and we tend to think of software as, as being very large, but not having a ton of end components. Even if it's you know millions of lines, how many libraries do you end up with? Well, Fareed did a little bit of graphing on this and came out with this dependency graph for Ruby. Just Ruby out of Nix. Um, I made a similar graph out of one of the library dependencies that's commonly used in HPC codes at Livermore. It has this many dependencies also. And then in addition to that, you get Python, you get all the other things, right? It can be hundreds of modules sometimes. Um, and even if it's not, there are a variety of problems that can crop up. Shared libraries. I like to joke that they're, they cause many problems, but they also solve many problems. Packagers love shared libraries because it means if there's a security update and the interface has not changed, the ABI has not changed, you can download a single package and everything that uses it will immediately get the fix. That's great. It helps with maintenance. If you get a bug fix, you can do the same thing. 
it makes your downloads smaller. It makes the amount of bandwidth that a, a Linux distribution needs smaller. But the problem with shared libraries is how they're resolved. When you build an application using a bunch of shared libraries, you expect to get a certain set of libraries as a result. And there are a bunch of different ways that that result can be changed at runtime. So quick, short thing on what's going on here so that some of the terms will make sense. A binary in terms of a Linux system has a tendency to be an ELF format. This is the common thing used by a lot of Unix-like systems. There are a couple of alternatives, but this is the one we'll care about for right now. It's made up of headers and sections. The sections have headers. The specifics of these mostly don't matter, except that the way that you find shared libraries for a dynamically linked application is from a list of entries in, a sec in needed. And that list contains the names of the libraries, not the whole file. For example, libgmp.so.10 would normally be encoded as just GMP. You can also have full paths to a library here. But at runtime, what happens, you load up an interpreter, it loads your program, it gets the list of needed entries in the program, then searches a list of paths, and the first one that matches, it checks it. If the architecture doesn't match, it throws it away, it goes and finds the next one, if it does match, you go down the list and you take it. But then after you've done all the ones for your current set of libraries, you circle back to that first library and check and see if it has needed. And how you determine the list of paths you search is either from a set of paths encoded on the executable, a set of paths encoded on the library, a set of environment variables, a set of caches set up by the system administrator, or by inheriting settings through other libraries that have come before. And predicting exactly what that set is going to be is very difficult. And it can be changed in dynamic ways, especially if you use a module system to load something like a new compiler or load a shell script that pulls in new versions of libraries. And in real life, this is output from a program called libtree that looks at binaries. So this is looking at DB wrap tool, which is from uh, the you know, Linux CIFS Samba implementation. And it walks through the libraries one of the settings you can put on a library to tell it where to go, Fareed mentioned this, is run path. Run path works great as long as it's specified everywhere that you need it. But it doesn't get passed to libraries that you've loaded. So you can end up with a library being found, like this lib samba debug samba four, is found by run path in db wrap tool. But if the load order were to change so that lib pop samba3 samba4 gets loaded first, it would actually give an error and never find the library because the run path is missing. And this is the kind of thing you never find this bug until some user goes to load the library in a way that you didn't necessarily expect or load something slightly differently than you expected, and then it blows up. And as the installer, it can be kind of maddening because you largely don't want this to happen. So what we came up with as an option is called shrink wrap. This is actually a repository for read put together on GitHub. It's a cool project. Please check it out. If you ever run into problems like this, the idea is it hoists all the needed entries into the binary. It encodes them as the full path. So you always load the same set. And then the caching and deduplication in the loader mean that you get everything the same way every time. Which means that now our loading is reproducible from what we had in the build environment. It's deterministic. 
assuming everything is still there. I mean, if you delete a library, well, you get to keep both pieces. But of course, as with anything, there's a catch, right? Muscle and some other libcs don't implement the deduplication and caching the way that we need them to for this to work. So we've been working with those communities to try and figure out what we can do about that. Um, dynamically opening libraries through APIs at runtime, like DL open, that still searches through our path or run path. We don't have a way to directly replace it. If we know exactly those libraries up front and it's safe to load them as needed entries, then we can fix it by adding them as needed entries. But figuring that out is tricky. We're currently looking into tracing successful runs of the application to record them so we can do that more effectively. And finally, determining the correct load order can be difficult. You can end up with multiple libraries providing symbols and it matters which one comes first. But in the end, we get reproducible loading, we can recreate behavior during the shrink wrap phase reliably in difficult user environments which makes it easier for us to reproduce things when we need to run them later, even if there have been significant system changes. And that's shrink wrap. All right, thanks, Tom. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm last, so well, I'm unable to make short slide decks, so I'll share my longest one and try to do it fast. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, something related to at least the, the, the first and third talks here. Um, I think like Farid and Tom have already set this up uh, pretty well. Um, SPAC is another one of those systems that uses the store model. Um, it is for building large chunks of dependency libraries. So like things like MPEM, which is a finite domain or a finite element library. Um, LBAN is a neural net for HPC library, and Mumi is the giant amalgamation of MD codes and HPC schedulers and workflow tools and ML. Um, all of these have lots of dependencies, and so we build things like this. Um, we also build things like the E4S stack, um, which is even larger than all of those things. It's like 100 packages with 600 dependencies. Um, all of these things are hard to get to work deterministically, as Tom just finished talking about. And um, you know we, we like to build multiple configurations of them on different machines. And so you know it's it's debatable whether any two deployments of, of like E4S have ever been exactly the same um, when when they've been deployed on different systems. Um, I, I'm pretty sure some of them have. Um, and, and, and using package managers has helped with this, but I wouldn't say that uh, but the spec's a little different from something like this. If you think about SPAC, um, it provides this, it, it has, there's there's sort of three concepts you really need to know to understand what it does. Um, in Nix, you would be hacking on package files and, or you know, Nix, uh, what is it, derivations for different packages, which is basically its own little functional language. In SPAC, um, there is this higher level language that we let users type on the command line. So it starts with basically just a name for a package. So if you want to install all MPI leaks, you can, you just say it's back install MPI leaks. That means get me a working MPI leak. Um, you can specify versions. You can specify what compiler you want it built with. You can inject options and compile time or, um, compiler flags into the build. And all of these things basically go towards, um, you know, their, their constraints. They are, you know, refinements on the build configuration that, that you're asking for. Um, you can ask for specific microarchitecture targets. So even more fine grained control of the compiler with a little abstraction on top for recognizable processor names. And then um, you can specify that about dependencies. Um, so we have a pretty detailed um, high level syntax for basically saying what parts of the installation do you really care about? What do you want SPAC to do? Um, and the packages are templated. Um, they basically, they specify lots of versions. So this says what possible versions of this package could install, what options are on it. So should I build with MPI or without MPI? Should I build with MP, OpenMP or without OpenMP? Um, and Altogether, this defines sort of a combinatorial space of packages that you could build. Um, and this stuff down here is the recipe. Um, it basically says how to take a configuration that SPAC has selected for you out of all the possible ones um, and to, to build it. Um, so we're really taking the sort of compatibility decisions away from the user and leaving them up to a solver. I'll get to that. 
Um, and all the user has to do is, is know how to translate a valid configuration for the package to a set of build um, instructions. And so, you know, it's, it's not as complicated as a lot of install scripts where you poke around on the system and say, hey, is this installed here? Is this installed here? It's not stateful based on what's installed um, in advance. It's stateful based on the ways that packages can be installed. And we, we have the store model like Nix. Um, we basically take all of the configuration information for a subgraph turn it into a hash and install every package in a unique directory, sort of like Fareed described earlier. Um, tying all of this together is this notion of concretization, which is our word for dependency solving. Um, and so given a description of a package like this, this is sort of an abstract, abstract or functional requirement description um, of what you want installed. Um, we take that, we stick it on a graph, we put some constraints on it, and we do this concretization process that turns it into a graph with everything specified. Um, and this is what ends up getting passed to the install recipe um, for installation. And we store that. And we store an exact um, set of metadata um, that's basically every decision that the solver uh, or the concretizer made. Um, we generalize this to environments. So you can have a bunch of specs um, all together. So if you want like three packages in the same environment, you can specify that. You could put constraints on them here. Um, and there's other ways to express preferences for the solver. And we'll concretize this whole thing um, into what we call a spec.lock file. So there's a spec.yaml file, which is like an abstract description of what you want, um, and a spec.lock file, which is basically everything that the solver did. Um, and you could version these two things in a repo. You could reproduce an environment exactly from the lock file, or you could do this sort of functional reproduction from just the requirements um, from the YAML file, like if you wanted to build the same thing on two different machines. Um, at the core of SPAC is this concretizer, and you know it, it takes um, information in the package files that come from contributors, all the different possible versions. It takes preferences from um, developers and users and from the command line, puts that all together and, and produces this um, concrete spec that you end up installing. Um, it's an NP hard problem. Um, and this is really why you know, we think that it ought to be left up to a solver to do um, rather than humans. So like projects like Nix and Geeks have solvers, they have names and live in actual locations in the world. Um, and they work on the, you know, the package repository for Nix, basically writing all the exact requirements. You could think of Nix as basically a system where you write the output of the concretizer um, into a package file. Um, and, and you have like a fully specified um, you know, package description there. Um, there's no solver in between the high level description and that, that output. Um, we use something called ASP um, for concretization. It's a logic programming paradigm. Um, it looks a lot like Prolog. Um, it, it's basically a, a sort of non-Turing um, complete dialect of Prolog that boils down to a SAT solver underneath with optimization. And so you write this list of facts about your problem. Um, you give it a, a small logic program that sort of describes the semantics of how you want the thing solved along with some optimization criteria. And it spits out a graph um, that is the you know the, the concrete version of the spec. Um, I'm going to skip through all this. ASP has facts. You can say you know what's true about the problem. It has rules. You can basically say if you have facts that look like this in your problem, that you can derive um, other uh, things that are true. So if you have like node lamps and lamps depends on CUDA and it's a link dependency, then you know that um, CUDA has to be in the graph as well. Um, you can do things like disallow cycles fairly easily. And you can give the solver choices. So you can say, hey, if I have a node in the graph, um, then I have to choose exactly one version from all the possible versions of that node. Um, and what ASP does in the end is it takes all those rules and all of those facts and it searches for um, a stable model, which you can loosely think of a have as a fixed point. Um, you basically try to find a state where you can't apply a rule and have the state change. Um, and, and so it's run all the rules out to their logical conclusions find um, stable models where basically the problem is fixed. Um, and those are your, your solutions. Um, unlike Prolog, um, ASP is guaranteed to complete. So we like that property for usable tools for people. Um, and uh, the stable models actually contain everything that can be derived. It's not like Prolog where you're querying certain things about the problem and the unification is done when you do the query. It basically finds all the different, it can find all the stable models and enumerate them. Um, so anyway, that's one way to do um, you know, a packet solve. And it enables us to put a lot of conditional logic in our packages um, that in a declarative way um, so that we can 
come up with solutions that meet particular you know uh, requirements easily. Um, so like for CUDA, we've been able to encode things like compatibility requirements between CUDA and the host compiler. Um, things like which versions of CUDA support which CUDA architectures and so on. So if the user asks for a particular CUDA arch, we know that you need a particular CUDA version to provide that architecture. Or if they ask for um, a particular um, GCC version with a CUDA that's too new for it, um, we will we'll complain about that. Um, and we can do that in a general way that applies to lots of packages. Um, one of the things that that we've done in the solver that, that I think is interesting recently um, is we've been able to um, get over one of the problems that's been in SPAC since the beginning, which is it does an awful lot of rebuilds. And, and Nix does something similar to this. Essentially, if you if you take um, this graph and, you know, like Fareed said, in, in all of these systems, we take sort of the, the full source provenance and metadata um, for the package and um, we compute hashes for each of these nodes, right? And the hash is a hash of the entire subgraph. Um, the way that we have historically done um, package reuse is to say, okay, well, we computed these hashes. Um, do we already have that hash installed? If yes, then we'll reuse it. If not, then we'll say, oh, we have to rebuild it because you asked for exactly this hash. And like Fareed said, it can be very sensitive um, to uh, you know, what the, the properties of sort of nodes that are deeper down in the graph. And so um, what users really want is, you know, if they have a good enough version of libdorf or if they have a good enough version of libdynance installed, um, they would often rather reuse it than rebuilding the whole thing from source. And so what we're able to do um, is we can tell the solver about all the installed hashes. And so we say, hey, there's an open SSL version installed. It has this hash. Um, and these are all the things that you have to make sure are true um, if you pick this hash and, and try to include it in your solution. And so it actually becomes pretty easy in ASP to express um, this kind of optimization where you want to say, reuse as many packages as you can. You basically say, hey, if a node's in the graph, um, then you can pick a hash or not um, from all the installed packages, um, that, uh, the, all the installed hashes for that package. So basically, if you have a bunch of versions installed, you tell the solver you can pick one. Um, then you say, okay, if you pick a hash, well, you have to impose all the constraints for it. Um, there's some extra logic that supports this in the solver. Um, and if you don't pick a hash for a package, well, then that's one that you have to build. Um, and once you've put these definitions in, um, it's enough for the solver um, to know how to minimize builds. Um, and so you basically say, hey, minimize um, at a certain priority with a certain weight. Um, the, whether or not, uh, minimize essentially the number of builds of packages that are in the solution. So you're gonna pick a solution that has the minimal number of builds over all the different solutions. Um, and so we've been able to use that um, in our solver to essentially avoid problems like this, where I try to install HDF5 um, and it says, yeah, you asked for a very different, the version of HDF5 I was able to come up with with these hashes um, is very different from every HDF5 that you have installed. So I'm gonna to have to rebuild the whole thing. Um, in reality, um, it could have reused 16 packages um, from the installation, um, at least according to the rules in the package files. Um, and so we're able to optimize for that. And you could think of this um, as you know, a way to optimize for similarity to what the user has installed on their machine. And so, you know, given the solver that has, you know, the ability to do all these different criteria and to, to optimize based on sort of similarity to a set of existing installs, um, we could expand on that. Um, so first of all, um, you know, some people say that these solver-based tools introduce some sort of, you know, confusing aspects to the dependency resolution process. And so, you know, whereas with Nix, if you have a bunch of packages and you say, here, uh, install these packages and they have the exact same source as another set of packages, um, you, you get basically the same output. With SPAC, we have a higher level set of inputs um, than the ones for like Nix and Geeks. Um, we, you saw the command line syntax is pretty terse. It basically only deals with the requirements that the user cares about, and we leave it up to the solver to make other decisions. Um, and so, yeah, the same abstract spec can result in lots of different concrete instantiations. Um, but I think that's good because that, that tends to be what users want. They, they don't necessarily want um, you know, exactly a particular version of, of software, um, they they might want, you know, the quickest version of it to install to use in their scenario. And if they already have a bunch of other things that they want to use with it, um, it pays to make it compatible with those things that are already installed. So um, in another sense, the solver-based tools are reproducible because you can take the solution, so the spac.lock file, 
And you can rebuild that everywhere. So if you have an exact description of what the solver came up with in one scenario, um, you can go and rebuild that on another machine and you can get complete reproducibility um, of an existing problem. Um, and another way to look at this is that actually solver-based uh, tools are sort of more reproducible than others um, because you can take the same high-level spec and you could actually build it on different machines. And so like we can take a spec.yaml, we can concretize that in two different ways for two different machines and we can get something that's functionally equivalent that has like HDF5, OpenMPI, and LibL or whatever in it. Um, and you know, as, as long as those are the only things you care about in your environment, um, sure, it's reproducible. It has the things you wanted. Um, and it, it, it does give you different um, results and they may be different at, at the bug level um, when you're done. Um, in HPC, you know, we care about approximate reproducibility across multiple machines um, in the sense that we're frequently comparing you know, big machines that have different architectures and different um, you know, hardware properties. And you know, how else would you compare different machines? If you have two builds for two different architectures, they're not the same necessarily. Um, they, they may have very different you know, compilations. They may have very different performance. And so you know, when you compare across CPUs and GPUs um, with different architectures, I think what you're really talking about is take the same software and compare it running on those two machines as best as you can compile it on them. Um, and that's typically what you know, you're comparing in a benchmark or something like that. So approximate reproducibility matters. Um, now, could we do better than what we're doing right now? Um, a common complaint that comes up for um, stack packages is if you give it the same stack.yaml on two different machines, it may come up with very different um, versions um, of, of the software on the two different machines because you know, maybe some versions are incompatible, maybe some uh, with, with a particular architecture or some haven't been ported yet or things like that. Um, we could take essentially the same kind of optimization that we do for reuse right now and modify it to give something that's basically as close as possible to an existing um, concrete um, instantiation of, uh, of an abstract spec. So if you take a spec.yaml that has the requirements in it, and you've already built that spec.yaml on one system, and you want to compare essentially the performance of that to another, um, we could essentially treat the lock file from the first system as preferences for the second um, concretization. And so we could take um, something that was installed on one system and instead of um, optimizing for number of builds used um, from the existing set of builds, um, we could do something finer grained. We could essentially optimize for the number of attributes um, on the nodes, the number of properties, variants, and so on, um, and try to make those as similar as possible to the first system. Um, and so, you know, we haven't done that yet, um, but it is, you know, something that, that we can think about um, for, for the future of SPAC. And I think, you know, that, that's an interesting take on reproducibility because it's, it's not necessarily, um, it's not quite as dedicated to getting sort of the bitwise same answer or, you know, exactly the same um, description. It's saying, you know, given a particular abstract description of what you want, can I reproduce the conclusions that you would get with that on another system? And so, you know, I think this, this gets us a little closer to that. So that's the end of my part of this. All right. Okay. So um, do we have any questions in the Google Doc or do people have questions now that they want to ask? Folks? Let me check the Google Doc first and then I will. Um, nope, no questions in the Google Doc. Okay, any questions in chat? Um, nope, but uh, okay. So I guess uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, Carlos. Yeah, actually, not so much a question, but I really love the way you you framed this, right? Because this has been um, uh, a big part of the motivation for reusability for me, at least. And and you you find other people as well that they argue that actually reuse will in, in some cases sell better and convince more people to to invest in reusability and in, in reproducibility uh, once you put like reuse as as a as a motivation, you know, include reuse as a motivation. Um, I personally think that the, the the killer app of reproducibility is really the classroom, right? It's it's people who want to tinker with um with new ways of of using a research result and build new things on it. Right. And so container-based solutions are fundamentally limited because you don't get to build things. You just get to uh, just see an exact same setup and you can maybe vary the input, but you don't get really the, the, the real power from 
from actually being able to to modify to modify the things. things. Yeah. Yeah. Any of the panelists want to take that on? Want to, want to comment on that? Tom, you had a smile on your face. So I'm going to call on you first. <laughs> sure. I mean, it, I I largely agree with the the sentiment. I mean, it, reproducibility is something that we we need to be able to actually verify that our results mean something. But it's it's much easier to pitch if you also get more out of it. And being able to reuse components is something that is is a very good way to do that but it's also frequently lost when you start working at reproducibility because you end up packing things up in containers or otherwise kind of freezing them in time and potentially making them less accessible or extensible as a result so there's a balancing act between what we do with our our components and our, our artifacts in that sense i see um I like, and this is kind of tied to your approximate stuff. I like now seeing the spectrum of reproducibility and, and this um, goes a little bit to, um, what was her name? Harshita's, um, you know, when I thought about performance optimizations there, they've always understood the spectrum like 01, 02, 03. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like for the longest time reproducibility has been, you know, debug only or 03. And 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 then yeah, taking it to that spectrum is really interesting. I think that there's a lot of interesting room there to play with. Well, and to, it's actually even more nuts than that. I mean, like it, for some of our codes, like we'll exclude particular files from optimization because they become wrong um, when you compile them with optimization with certain compilers, and other files in the same um, you know program will be will be optimized. And so is that you know reproducible i don't know like it's it's sort of up to the app developers to to sort of figure out what's correct where and you know if if o3 is correct on one architecture and not another or one compiler and not another i mean is that is that reproducible i don't know i mean that that seems like it, it gets pretty pretty hairy uh, a thought on that is most of the time the reason that happens is because the algorithm is not stable so you have yeah, to that's... step back and see mm -hmm. where is it coming from. Yeah, so I guess, could you be able to reproduce results from unstable algorithms? Could you be using unstable algorithms? Yeah, well, there's, yeah, that's a whole other question, right? Like, I mean, I think when you get numerical with these things, it, it, it becomes much more complicated. Like it, it, there is a lot of programs where it's like, okay, sure. It's if we're just talking about bugs or particular versions or something like that, um, then then sure it's black and white, it's correct or not. But for a lot of scientific applications, that's not the the way the app works. It's the the app is really solving for you know it's solving some problem within tolerance, and there's a whole lot of depth to that. Yep. Todd, I have a question for you for SPAC actually. Okay. What what is the plan for like? An issue I have with Nix often is the sales pitch could should be I can check out any arbitrary commit and build the package. In, oh, in practice, I, I, I in practice the last ahead, mile. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I was going to say in practice the last mile is the get fetching the source, and that's uh, free to disappear or four hundred four, and yeah. so you you know like. It doesn't take much time for a single commit of Nix packages, which is the, the complete working set, um, to to quickly become unbuildable. So does Nix have a mirror? I mean, because so in SPAC we sort of address this problem because we have a giant S3 bucket with CDN, where we basically suck in every tarball that's ever been talked about in a at least in a mainline SPAC package. Um, and so you know we we provide that level of resilience for users already. Because and by default we register the SPAC mirror and it, those are fetched by SHA-256, um, and so like you know if if you put a patch in it it mirrors the patch to the to the S3 bucket and we'll have a copy of it um, that at least we're pledging to keep around. Um, the, this the problem still comes up um, with like so some companies are hostile to old versions there are people using old versions of their software so like Intel won't let us mirror their compilers. 
um, and frequently removes old versions of their compilers from their repository. And so, I mean, it, honestly, there's not much we can do about that because we're like legally required not to mirror their tarball, right? And, and so if we could, if we could keep copies around, I guess we could internally, um, then, then we could do something about it. But it, as it stands, like, no, we can't do much. Yeah. Someone's saying, and uh, yeah, the, Nix does take that approach for some, but um, the working set is is much larger. I, I don't. I, I mean, it is pretty large, so I, I think it they expunge some of it pretty eventually. I was talking. There's an effort for a free software foundation to kind of do that um, to to work with Nix. I don't know if you're working with them also to basically. No, but is the FSF like what are they? I guess I'm I'm reminded of all the SSF mirror outages that we have encountered in the history of SPAC, which is actually one of the motivations for us having our own mirror in an actual cloud because the Free Software Foundation is opposed to the evils of clouds and has like it like there was a giant outage for four days when they decided to move their server from one college student's bedroom to another and like or or wherever it was they were hosting that thing. And you know. If, if you had cloud infrastructure, that would not have been a problem, but because they, their, their argument was that any cloud could go away at any given time because you're relying on an unreliable corporation. So, you know, we, we should be hosting our own infrastructure. So they really adopted the IPFS. I, I don't know how far, I haven't looked at it. Oh, into. okay. Yeah. That could help. But, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Someone gave recently a talk where the, the store will automatically fetch from Software Heritage Foundation archives that are on yes. that are on IPFS, and I, I like that as the talking about the gradient, like more towards the pinnacle of like an asteroid hitting Earth. Can you rebuild source, you know, software from source? Yeah, the Software Heritage people are interesting because so I, I'm actually that's cool that Nix is involved in that now because I thought it was only geeks for a while because I know that some of the uh, geeks people were involved with the, the Software Heritage people. Um, those folks were some of the original like package manager researchers. I don't know if you've seen the Mancusi project from like the 2000s, but yeah, they they were sort of they wrote the original report that showed the package solving was NT complete, and they also did some early work on understanding software ecosystems. So that's cool that they're working with Nixon geeks. Any other questions from the audience on reproducibility? I guess. Um, yeah, Emily said this is really helpful for her. Thanks for everyone. She's new to learning about reproducibility. I guess. Yeah. What's What's your take on all this, Emily? Do you have a, any any thoughts you want to share with folks? Oh, I mean, nothing really. It's not my area at all. I'm a educator, a computer science educator, <laughs> but I'm one of the OSPO fellows and I've, you know, just recently been hearing Carlos talk a lot about reproducibility and, um, it's, you know, it seems like such an obvious thing to matter. Like, you know, once he, I'm mm -hmm. hearing him talk about it, but not something I would have really thought about before because it looks really different in a, like a classroom uh, teaching context, I guess, the sort of conferences I go to, so. Yeah. So yeah, it's just really it was really just interesting for me to to hear more about like what it what it's like to do research in this space and all that. Thanks. Tom, were you gonna say something? I actually was was thinking one of our, I imagine at least for people with a background in CS, one of our first experiences with reproducibility or lack thereof has a tendency to be, well, my homework worked on my computer. And not actually being able to redistribute results in a way that always reproduces the way you want, right? It's funny, it shows up in just about every aspect of the stack, but the differences tend to be more in scale than whether they're there, right? Well, yeah, and if you're just learning, like, I mean, the sorts of problems that you encounter in that realm are pretty deep these days with all the different software that everything relies on. And so it's not, 100% apparent that if you're like in an intro class and you encounter an issue like that, that you would even know, you know, what to dig into to really understand, um, you know, why your thing is not reproducible. Yeah. 
actually was helping a new computer science student not too long ago try to figure out why their assignment where they were supposed to hit a button to get a, Ma a Maven project in Eclipse was getting 200 different Java exception errors <laughs> trying to set up the project. <laughs> Yeah, when I think kind of the closest like touchstone for me is thinking about um, I work with uh, faculty who are teaching open source and it's a huge stumbling block getting students like set up in a development environment. So I think sort of the closest thing that I can uh, tether all this to is like a move that's happening right now with having students use, you know, uh, or instructors are using Docker and stuff like that. Um, to eliminate some of this. But I also think there's like so much room for interesting conversations with students earlier, like you say, about things like, oh, my homework works on this computer, but not that computer. And, um, and I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that like happening yet, maybe just because of the people I know, but I think it would be really cool for those conversations to emerge. So. Yeah. Be great. One of the initial things that our advisor makers do is replicate some of the results that the old PhD students did, you know, some of the papers. And that would take us quite a bit of time to get the same results. And then you build on top of that. But those were the, my initial experience with reproducibility as a student, grad student. Well, I, we talked about papers now having, uh, I can't remember who mentioned the badges, like the, the, as more and more papers are requesting reproducibility, I want to tie back into the spectrum. I wonder, you know, in the future, will, will the, I mean, the badges now are pretty coarse and it's unclear what it means. I mean, clearly to Todd, to me, to different people, reproducibility means different things. And right now, I think it's great that we're capturing it with a badge, but I could see- Three, three you know, badges, actually. Three badges, but I mean, yeah. each badge could itself be a gradient. You know, um, you could imagine for ML, they don't really maybe care about binary reproducibility, but maybe you're building uh, codes that do a lot of floating point. And you, you probably really care about bit reproducibility there because you want to make sure all the opcodes you're emitting are going to be the same when you reproduce it. Otherwise, you might get weird floating point errors. So there's like binary, there's can you just build it? You know, maybe there's the concretization, like, will this just build? That's a pretty good start. Like, that's a pretty, you know, so I'd love to, I think that's an interesting future evolution that once reproducibility is more in people's mindset. So an interesting thing about the badges, like to your point, like there, there's three badges, right? There's like, what, like artifacts available. There's like ar artifacts, what, what's the second one? Functional. 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 Yeah, they work. Mm -hmm. And then there's, yeah, artifacts reproducible. Yeah, so we had with the, it, we had two papers, or I, I was on two papers in this area to SC. One of them got the reproducible badge and one of them did not. And, but the, the interpretation of what that meant by the different reviewers was clearly very different because on the other paper that got it, um that it was more like this clearly reproduced your conclusion it didn't produce the same scatter plot that was in the paper um, when they ran it um whereas like on on the paper that we were on for shrink wrap um you know they they seemed to really really care that the that the like the, they, they weren't able to reproduce the performance results for pynamic because they were for one of our experiments because they weren't able to run at a significant enough scale and so they didn't consider that the paper said basically this only appears at scale and they were like well i ran it at, on one node and y'all ran it on a hundred thousand and i didn't see the problem so you know the I, I think just on reviewer discretion it already kind of varies whether they interpret it as exact or um universal or um conclusion supporting so or or whether they read the paper i mean so that's another one but that's a that's a whole other discussion topic. The, I mean, maybe this is a silly question, again, since I'm coming from really a different area, but I'm curious, like, in terms of, um, like, cultural norms and values within the reprodu reproducibility community, whether it is considered more valuable to be able to reproduce, like, exactly the same, like, you know, raw result versus conclusion, like you're saying? Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't, I, I, I Carlos, you've seen a lot more of this than me, so maybe you're the right person to answer this because you've been on a lot of these reproducibility committees and seen 
you know, the range of uh, interpretations from the actual reviewers. So uh, is there a general gist of this that you've seen? It's actually a struggle, you know, that what we're seeing here is exactly also the struggle that we've seen, uh, that, that I've seen in all the reproducibility evaluation or artifact evaluation committees. Um, so the one that I, you know, I, I wasn't really directly involved, but um, Tanu Malik and uh, Anyu, and I forgot his last name, but it's the last long name. Um, there is actually a really nice report that you can read where all these things have been basically this or are, are being discussed uh, and actually establishing the kind of guidelines among for the reviewers, right? Uh, or what, when, how do you make the distinction between uh, an artifact functional and an artifact reproducible, right? And so, you know, if you look at the sort of high level description that you find in the journals and, and the ACM and IEEE, you know, when they put out the definitions for their badges, is basically that the reproducible badge is basically supporting the claims of the paper, right? So you can use that artifact to, uh, to basically create the support that uh, for those claims that are in the paper. So you list the claims, right? And then you sort of check them off. While the functional one is it compiles, it provides a result, but I haven't connected it to the claims yet. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the that's sort of the distinction that that um that that is sort of but then the the, the devil is in the details, right? So um what if you uh you know like Todd says, right, that you just can't recreate the exact environment for actually supporting the claim, right? Is it is it you know is or what if some of the claims are supported because they're ever you know they're easy to reproduce because they're in low scale uh well there's you know there are the other ones that are in large scale so is that artifact so there was like an example for instance where the authors of the reproducibility artifact scaled down the experiments just for the review um and so now the paper was about the large scale experiments, but the artifacts uh, were, you know, also supporting small scale experiments. So you could actually reproduce them in a, you know, in, in a sane environment, basically, that's available to, to the reviewer, right? So is that actually now a reproducible artifact or is it a just a functional artifact, right? So there's like all these gray zones. And I think um, I think this is the, I think you know there's definitely room for for you know finding kind of more yeah I think what you said earlier I think it was taught right or uh, I forgot who but it's like the very coarse grained definition of reproducibility in these badges um, it is coarse grained right there's there are nuances in it that 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 I think need to be sort of worked out still and um, so. There's, there's well, there's no, there's no standard metric or anything that you could use to make the continuum that Farid was describing, right? Like mm -hmm. we don't currently have tools, or at least standardized ones, to to say how close was the build to the original one, how close was the machine to the original one, how close were the results to the, or how well did it fit the conclusions? And I think a lot of times that requires like some understanding of the domain, which is. Uh, which is even more tricky because it's in, in a lot of these cases it's it's hard to find reproducibility reviewers who also know the domain of the paper mm -hmm. yeah and especially in hpc where it's kind of a multidisciplinary area so like they, we, we all are practicing you know we're, we're looking at how applications run on large systems but the application domains are so diverse like you need a phd in those areas to understand the application and so coming up with standards on error bounds or even understanding the error bounds for a simulation is hard So is it like, are the people who are doing, who are actually like trying to reproduce results, it's usually like a, a reviewers who would be doing that work or is it work that people are doing and then actually publishing on? So there's a separate committee for um, reproducibility. And so if, if we, if I pulled up like SC21. Um, yeah, I can also I can find a committee like yeah. they, how many subcommittees did you and Evo have, Carlos? Like, yeah, so yeah, so we had basically three subcommittees, but we had and actually ended up having four subcommittees because we also introduced this award. But basically, there's one subcommittee that that we had for uh, 
artifact evaluations. And that was led by Tanu and Anyo. And, um, and that basically, you know, we're reviewers that um, were recruited mostly, we've tried to get a good balance between sort of senior reviewers and junior reviewers, right? Um, uh, mostly uh, graduate students, but also some postdocs and also some some professors, right? So, um, and 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 I think there's sort of this this there was a very important consideration here that we wanted to very clearly delineate the responsibilities of those committees from the program committee, which is the technical program committee, right? They decide whether a paper gets accepted. In the past, there were like these. Where when once you make a requirement that you have some kind of you know artifact description in your paper, then that requirement is actually automatically goes somehow into the program committee, which makes the decision whether to accept a paper or not, right? Whether the requirements are met. And so that creates sort of a conflict between the artifact evaluation committee and the program committee. So we kind of solved this by saying the decision of whether to accept the paper or not is solely with the program committee and the artifact evaluation committee can only make recommendations related to a particular artifact. Um, and we would only consider accepted papers for the artifact evaluation, right? This is actually where the bulk is. So artifact description is a just verbal description of an artifact, which I thought always sort of, before I actually really looked at the details, thought it was kind of a inferior way of reproducibility, but the cool thing about words is that they are timeless, right? So you can always look at the words and and that's better than actually having nothing or having some kind of binary that doesn't run anywhere anymore, right? And so, um, so it's actually, there's value in artifact descriptions, but for shorter term, there's a much greater potential, right? To have artifacts, actual artifacts, digital artifacts to, to, to work from. Um, and so then the artifact evaluation is a lot more overhead. It's very iterative. And so we decided very quickly, you know, we will only consider accepted papers. And we also only consider batch applications. That was another innovation we introduced. The authors had to actually say whether they're actually interested in, a, in, in an artifact evaluation, right? Some of them aren't. And then they don't, we don't have to review them, right? And so... And when they actually do, uh, when they are interested, they had to actually write an application and had to sort of say why they think they need, you know, they 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 deserve an, an, an a reproducibility batch, for instance. And so that's that's another thing that that kind of limits the set of um, of papers that have to be or artifacts that have to be reused, you know, in sort of the the one that makes sense. Um, uh, and so then it also it separates it from the program committee because the program committee did already the work by accepting a paper. And now it's only about getting the artifacts into shape that, you know, and, and figure out what batches to give. What's cool is that they do show the badges on the, on the program now. So like, if you look at SC yep. 22, like you can see here, there's like the, the different badges that different papers got. Um, on on the schedule yeah and we introduced that in s21 as well um yeah in, in 21 you can even tag there's actually a tag for reproducibility there's previously batches i don't know whether they have that here um but if you look at tags i don't know whether last time i looked they didn't oh yeah there we go perfect and then so i guess they didn't they, i don't think they've applied the tag well <laughs> so if you pick it it doesn't show any papers um, oh. <laughs> yeah. Right. Maybe maybe they'll yeah maybe I should email them to work on that, but anyway they, yeah so that you can you can definitely see next to every paper whether it got badges or not so that's pretty cool. Cool, yeah I think that um, so thank you for those questions Emily that's that's um, and I think there's you know I I posted at least for the systems community there is this website called sysartifacts.github.io. Uh, and it has it covers uh, systems conferences as well as um, uh, security conferences, but there's actually a large community of conferences. Um, let me just uh, draw that up here. Um, 
Sorry, I don't have that. Oh, so, oh here we go. Um, that, and it's not, it's a little bit out of date because we did that, but it's basically a Google document that, is that the right? No, that's incomplete. Sorry. Cut and paste didn't work. Um, here's the one. Um, so it's basically a, a list of uh, conferences that have um, a distinguished artifact award or something reproducibility related award. Um, and, cool. and then there's also some workshops. Uh, and and I, I should also use this opportunity because we're about to run out of time. Um, to, to do a quick plug, we just decided, so there is an emergent interest group in the ACM about reproducibility. And uh, Ivo in particular, you started this workshop called PREX, Practical Reproducibility and Evaluation of Computer Systems. And it's been always sort of co-located with HPDC, but we finally decided to put this workshop, turn it into a full, like a three-day conference. And it's going to be on June 27th through 29th at UC Santa Cruz. So, um, and we want to definitely, you know, include some of the work here uh, that has been discussed here as well. Um, and so we're super excited about it. We got tons of really positive feedback also from the audience, uh, the Open Source Symposium, um, you know, industry people. They're just that that's really what's needed. Uh, one of the things that we want to introduce, we want to basically encourage all the program committees from, and also the chairs from all those conferences that have these awards to recommend or encourage the authors to submit an experience report to this conference. Um, so you can see sort of across all those, you know, different computer science areas, um, uh, people to you know, hear the experience of, of doing these reproducibility artifacts. And we have a lot more plans. We, we also got recently an NSF grant for, for, for FAROS, um, uh, RCN is a research coordination network uh, together with Kate Kihi and, and Frida Fund at um, NYU Tandor. Um, that to to essentially so the the, the role for Santa Cruz is to create a, a a summer of reproducibility, which is sort of based on the Google Summer of Code, uh, but uh, uh, looking at involving summer students to do reproducibility related work, and um, and so that's what we're basically starting like in the next few months, and then the next summer is going to be the first summer. So all of this is 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 pretty exciting. So um, so, but definitely save the date for 20, June 27th, 29th. Um, and then we will we come we'll be coming out with like um, a call for participation pretty soon. Carlos didn't mention that he also established the reproducibility award for SC. So that was that was another SC21 thing. Yeah, and, 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 and Harshita won it. So, yeah. so this is this is definitely not an incestuous panel in any way whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, um, well, thank you so much. So, I let I let you close the panel. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks, everyone. I think that was a lot of interesting perspectives and exploration of the reproducibility space. Hopefully, from some ways you haven't thought about it before. Um, I guess I guess that's it. And we're one minute from time. So I think we did a pretty good job. Thanks for the discussion and audience participation. So see you next time. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.